Hi, everybody. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. And I think um, Maya is our tech guru, so she's going to start recording. Yes, I have started recording. OK, so um, quick introductions. Um, let's see. So we will um, do the round robin pass it off thing. So my name is Carol Fall, and I'm the chair of the fire safe council and i'm kind of going to be winging it today because amelia is um in colorado and so maya is going to be helping so I'll let maya introduce herself um i'm maya williams the education and outreach coordinator for the trinity county rcd um and yeah i guess i'll pass it off to, to me Hi, I'm the GS manager for the Trinity County Resource Conservation District. My name is Denise Wesley, and I will pass it off to Chris. Uh, I'm Chris Cole. I'm the Trinity County RCD Forest Health Program Manager. Brian, uh, Brian Ward, Sheriff's Office. Jill Cox, Board of Supervisors, and I'll pass it over to Dave Johnson. Howdy, Dave Johnson. Forest Health Coordinator at the Trinity County RCD. Pick a person, Dave. No, he's muted. Tiffany Perez. Hello, everybody. Tiffany Perez, the soil conservationist for NRCS. I will pass it on to Marla. Marla, you're muted. Marla. <laughs> OK, we'll catch up with Mar Marla later. How about Aaron? Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Erin Taylor, and I'm uh, the NRCS outgoing uh, district conservationist for Trinity County. Um, so tomorrow will be my last day with Trinity County. However, I'm just uh, next door um, over in Humboldt County and uh, Del Norte. So I will be the acting district conservationist over there. Um, for the next 120 days or so. So I know there's gonna be a lot of conversations and action involving the Willow Creek Sawyer uh, down tree project. So um, feel free to touch base with me in that capacity. Thank you. Okay, pass it on to... All right, well, let's see. I'm just gonna pick names. Tim, Richie, you wanna introduce yourself, Tim, please? Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tim Richie. I'm the Fuels Battalion for the Forest Service here in Weaverville. And I also have Chris Woodman. He's a fire engine operator out of Coffee Creek. And uh, he's currently detailed as a fuels technician uh, in the office here. Okay, thank you. Um, how about Basho? Hello, uh, my name is Basho Parks. I represent the Lower Trinity River uh, Prescribed Burn Association. Uh, I'm also a director of the board with Blaise on the Fire Safe Council. Uh, and I am currently AD uh, employed with uh, Six Rivers National Forest Lower Trinity in a fuels technician capacity as well as of this afternoon. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, who are we missing? I think Marla, are you there? Okay. I should also say that Blaze is here with me in the building uh, representing the Fire Safe Council. Sorry. Great. Okay. All right, thanks. Did I miss anybody? All right, so let's get started. So um, welcome. And um, do we have any additions or changes to the agenda that was sent out? All right, hearing none. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Brian Ward um, with the Sheriff's Department and kind of 
um, give us an update on where we're at with all the evacuation zones, especially considering this potential upcoming wildfire season. Hey, Brian Ward, Sheriff's Office. Amelia reached out to me, asked me to come in and talk about what we're working on with the zones for the county. So last couple of years with fires that we had, bringing in these larger uh, incident management teams with Forest Service and CAL FIRE, uh, it started to become evident that one of the things that they're wanting from us um, for warning and orders and repopulation is having our county broke up into zones. Um, having dealt with the last couple of years, um, I can agree with them. This is a process that just about every county is going to already uh, with having their counties broke up into zones so that we can uh, work on educating our population on where they live, um, being able to put it out there to them. You know, when we talk about this zone is under orders, warnings, or we're starting repopulation of these areas, um, they'll have an idea of what we're talking about. So last year, um, we brought Butte County up to help us break our county up into zones. Our search and rescue team for the last several years has been used in SAR Topo, and it's a mapping system. I don't know how many people are familiar with it, but it's basically, it's a free system. You can go on to it and you as an individual can sign up and go into SAR Topo and use it as a mapping um, software. Um, we as a SAR team have a team account. It costs us a little bit of money, but it allows us to share some of the maps as we create them for searches. It allows us to share them amongst the other team members. So uh, anybody on the team can get on it and see what type of maps we have. So using SAR Topo, uh, Butte County came in. And this is something that they had already done in their county. They broke up our county into zones. So we have um, the counties now broke up into the different zones. Some of the things that we are working on now that we've got the zones broke up is working with the RCD to be able to put these out on maps, get them out, uh, working with educating the public on what the zones are um, for their areas. So Coffee Creek, you know what the zones are, Weaverville, so on and so forth. Uh, some of the other projects we're working on, Steve winton has been huge with helping with this. Uh, utilizing the code red system. Uh, we're working on trying to use the code red system to where we can have these zones defined, you know, as far as the parameters, this location to that location, so on and so forth, preloaded into the code red system so that when we want to put the information out over the code red, the dispatchers don't have to create a polygon map, then create a description on top of answering their calls, on top of radio calls. The idea behind this will be as all these things are preloaded and saved into uh, files to where they can just grab those files, load them into the code red and put them out. And then it would just be adding on there that this area is under warning, this area is under orders or whatever information we're looking at for that zone. Uh, what we're hopeful too is with the SAR Topo, uh, part of you can create maps off of the system. Like for the SAR team, we'll go in and build search areas, and then we can create an overall map of that area um, with the search areas highlighted inside, print those off. They come with QR coding already on them. So being able to do that. Um, we're hopeful that we can add the QR or add the, a, like a URL um, into some of the code red to where people can go onto the sites and pull the maps off and not only have the verbiage come over text, email, but come out over their phone as well, but being able to look at it in a text message or on 
um, an email and have a URL there that they could actually go in there and then pull up that map and actually see the map as well to see what we're talking about. Um, again, hopefully being able to create some of the maps to be able to put out into the communities. They already have the QR codes where people can walk up with their phones and download them right to their phone and have the information or have the map that we put out. So that's some of the stuff that we're working on. Um, like I said, Steve Renton's been huge with this as a uh, SAR member. Um, he's got a good knowledge base to SAR Topo um, and the Code Red system. So as of right now, that's kind of where still in the early stages of this, but that's where we're hoping to uh, take this from just having it on a map, having the county broke up, but also how can we uh, deliver that information out to uh, our communities um, early education wise, but also at a time when the incident's actually uh, uh, occurring. One of the other nice features with SAR Topo is, is that um, it allows us to modify real time. So not that we want to go in and modify these zones. That's not what we're really looking to do. If we have zone one, two, three, and four, we want to keep those. But there may be instances where we want to modify those zones and break them up further than what they are. An example that I give is like last year, we ended up having uh, Coffee Creek Training Center broke up into zones. When it came time for repopulation, one of the zones uh, had an area that was populated and the rest of the zone was not populated. The zone, the area of that zone that was not populated, we did not want to take that out of orders. We wanted to leave the evacuation orders in place and keep people out of there. The area that was populated, we felt was safe enough to open it up to a warning. So we were able to break that zone up into, let's say it was zone seven, break it up into zone seven, seven A, seven B, allowing us to keep seven A uh, closed under orders, but also allowing us to then uh, put seven B under warnings. So again, utilizing Sartopa, we're able to do that on the maps and then be able to push those maps back out to the community. So that's some of what we're uh, working on right now. And yeah. Okay. You guys have questions for Brian? Um, Basho? Nope, okay. So um, I think last time we, we talked a little bit about some of the other counties are adopting Zone Nation. Zone but Haven. Zone Haven. We're going to stay with Code Red. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, well, my, as far as I know, it's Zone Haven. I think that just breaks the counties up into zones. I don't know if that actually delivers the messages like Code Red or I'm not familiar with it. Um, so. Okay. But that's uh, the code. one we just heard about at the previous meeting, mm -hmm. which was yeah. expensive, and I think so. It was expensive, yeah. That's the problem was just talking to Ed Presley. I know the initial cost was one fee, and then it was an annual fee on top of that, both of which we don't have the money. Right, yeah. So, uh, yeah, well, this I gives us an option that I don't want to say it's going to be completely free, but this gives us the option of keeping the cost pretty low. So, and then, um, do some of our zones, um, do we know, overlap with adjacent counties, you know, or they just go to the county boundary? Like if it's a code red and we've done that polygon for code should red, it just, just stops. To, should go just to our county line. Okay. We don't have the ability to. I don't have the ability to issue orders into Humboldt County or Siskiyou, so we don't even want them overlapping. It so, is clipped to the boundaries. Uh, I've been working on making sure that it's all clear. Yeah. Those kind of things. So, so um, 
Denise was saying you were looking for feedback on the map then. Um, yeah, so that was Amelia's idea is that um, if there is any feedback on um, how the boundaries are drawn, if anything needs to be um, updated or fixed, or if there are any errors, that this would be a good opportunity to look at the map. And look at how, are, how are they defined currently? Like what delineates one zone from the next? That I don't know. I just took it off of Sartobo and I put yeah, it into our database. It's basically did it based off the features. Yeah, just ridge lines, so, stuff like that. Some could be ridge lines, creeks, you know certain uh, roadways mm -hmm. so. so if it's a roadway is it a potential that people on one side of the road would be in one zone and then on the other side would be they try not to they try not so. to okay i mean there is that potential but if they've already looked yeah. at that i mean i don't know but i haven't looked at in detail to do any analysis on that but that's what i think amelia was wanting us to look at so if people were going to try to look at the map and give you feedback, what would be the best way to do that? Um, well, there are a number of ways you can do that. So um, did you get the um, email from Amelia where she posted the maps on Google Drive? I don't think so. There are some maps there that we can look at. People can mark them up. You can, um, any way you want to do that, you can use pencil, crayon, you can mark it up online. You can call me, you can tell me, I'll do some meeting. Okay. Oh, and um, so this is all in our database right now. And so um, there is a California evacuations layer. So if the sheriff's office gives us the information um, that needs to be updated, we can put that in the California evacuations layer and that can be disseminated to all of the adjacent counties. So and if I understand correctly, so we'll, you know, we'll take this map and run with it. But if we do find in the future that there are things that don't make sense, we could change them. Which, Absolutely. Yeah. We okay. can modify and that's, we, it, it gives us the ability to modify it ourselves, not have to reach out to a company and go, can you modify this? Oh, how much is that gonna cost us? So. So do you have any idea time frame wise when then these polygons would be actually in code red, you know, for this fire season? I just have the GIS part of it, so they're all in our GIS, and I don't know okay. anything beyond that about code red. We're still working with Steve and Ed with the code red. So. Okay. Okay. That sounds and great. Until we actually get into it and start putting a couple in, that'll give us an idea how fast or how slow it's going to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So. Can we have an update as you move through that process? Hopefully, as we get through this process, the plan would be to actually get something put together, an actual formal presentation to where we can put it out there and actually even do a, a bit of a demonstration with it. So that's the plan. And hopefully that'll be before fire season. So but again, hopefully. it's gonna depend on how long it's gonna take us to go through this load this, you know, so and until we actually get in there start doing it. Yeah, don't know yet. Hopefully we won't we won't need it, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Okay. All right. So um any other thoughts or questions from the group as far as developing these evacuation zones and getting them out to the public? You know, I'm I'm hoping that maybe we can at least start disseminating some of the stuff in May at the wildfire preparedness days and stuff, at least have the maps and stuff. I see some chat. Hey, Brian, this is Tim. Uh, can, you, can you just walk me through the different colors? Um, I, I see reds and yellows and greens. Um, and I was trying to find a legend within the, the star topo map, and I, I could not find one that showed me the difference for the zones and why they were coded in different colors. I think that's just how they uh, put them up there. We can change those as, as they go. Okay. Uh, the red, so. yellow, and green was used during the active fire season, so or the active fire. So somebody would call me and tell me yeah. there's something from active to not active so red was uh, an evacuation zone yellow was a warning and then green was yeah. free to go back in have you used this tim um i've seen it before uh in different areas but i haven't just working with incident management teams but uh yeah. you know i 
got it a couple of days ago when Amelia sent it out uh, briefly, and I've been kind of scrolling around as uh, we've been talking about it here. Yeah. My suggestion, anybody that is at all really interested in this stuff, going into it, uh, there's also an app that you can load onto your phone. And like I'm looking at it right now on my phone, I've pulled up the map and I have it. You can add overlays in there, like active fire, fire history, um, you know, wind direction, things like that. Um, during the fires, you know, a lot of people look at um, like InsaWeb as one of the sites. I kind of gave up on them um, and started using Sartopo for all the information. As far as updating, I think it updates as fast, maybe even faster than some of the other sites. Um, so, um, but yeah, I mean, like I was telling people, having it on your phone, having it on, on the uh, app. I mean, last year at one point I was out of the state, I was in Alaska and I was actually able to pull information up and I mean, I'm literally standing next to the river in Alaska and I was pulling up information on where the current fire was, wind directions, you know, things along those lines. So, um, weather. What's that? Temperature, weather, that, all that. Yeah. Um, you know, like I said, it's a, it's a neat little system, um, you know, and, Personally, if you're using anything, any type of mapping software, or anything, um, it's pretty user friendly. I mean, I can figure it out, so it's user friendly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Any other questions? Um, feedback for Brian and Denise on this kind of evacuation planning. That app's just called Sartopo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that for Apple and Android or is it just yes. Apple? Yeah. Now, and if you're looking at it on the. Uh, it was CalTopo, is that right? It says CalTopo. Oh. What, that's what the app looks like okay. going down here. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's what the app looks like. But if you just go in there and Google search Sartopo. Yeah. So. You can use it on your desktop too. Like I said, pretty much all your. It's not exclusive. OES isn't pushing it out for search and rescue, basically because marketing they can't whatnot. But um, essentially, all your search and rescue teams in the state are using this now. So, okay, all right. So look for the maps. Hopefully, it's some of the um, wildfire kind of stuff coming up in May. And then um, any feedback sent to Amelia and Denise. And it'd be great if we could get this organized. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So if there's nothing else. Yeah. I, I know you're a busy guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. OK. okay. Um, so I don't think we have any discussion items. Do you know? No. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we have three um, letters uh, supporting, uh, well, two are supporting grant applications and one is um, the fire risk communities. So um, the first letter of support is to Cal Fire for a block grant for funding the emergency forestry restoration team. Do you have anything you want to say about that, Chris? Yeah, just a, like a brief summary. So the emergency forest restoration team, it was kind of like piloted after the Calderon Dixie fires. And it's basically to get a team together of like qualified personnel, which would be us, the Watershed Center, as well as various contractors, you know, once we have funds to, in the event of a disaster, generally it's kind of focused on wildfire that the team would already be in place and have funding available to go in and basically start like salvage logging and start getting rid of like that bigger material that can be super difficult and expensive to get rid of once it loses commercial value. 
And then alongside that, we would also fund a couple of conservation planners that would work, you know, with the RCD as well as the NRCS to help front load some of the, the different kind of reforestation and like recovery programs. So if we're already going to be out there doing some salvage kind of stuff, might as well gather some of the data. We're already doing environmental compliance. So get the same data that way we could pass it off and get people into these other programs where they can get further help and do it on a, a faster, more accelerated time scale. Because a lot of times a few years out, they just have a bunch of standing dead timber that is worth nothing and then no one can really get rid of it without a really it's just really difficult for landowners. And so we would subsidize, potentially subsidize a lot of the cost and then money made from the sale of timber would go back into the program to further restoration for those landowners. So cool. So that's that's what the grant's for. So anybody have any questions for Chris about this letter of support then to Cal Fire? Any comments or concerns? Mm -hmm. How does any NEPA process? It's this is all private. All so private. this is all private. So it's still it still has to undergo the CEQA process. And there's for commercial sales, there's a lot of uh, exemptions for like disaster stuff, like so burned areas or you know bug kill. There's a bunch of disaster kind of exemptions. And then some of the some of the key stuff is that it has to be an RPF signing off on these things, and so that's a resource that's pretty limited, mm -hmm. lots of places, especially in the county. So the, the watershed has an RPF, and then we have lots of funds to potentially contract RPFs because that could be a bottleneck. But a lot of the a lot of the work can be done by lower qualified people as long as it's overseen by an RPF. So. So you get this funding if needed, obviously utilized, and if not, you just hold it over till. Yeah, it's still a, so it's still a grant. It still has a term, and it's some of it we would kind of use, even though it's a little after the fact for like the river complex for the monument mm -hmm. complex. So we could use some of it like currently, okay. and then I think, I mean, it's unfortunate, but it's highly likely it will be used for just that immediate response within the time frame. So. Yeah. Oh, hey, Deborah. Thanks for joining us. Um, okay, so then if there's no concerns or objections, I think the Fire Safe Council will go ahead and send that letter of support. Um, the next letter of support goes to the California Fire Safe Council. Um, and that is for the RCD to um, complete the CWPP update. So is that Maya or Chris? Uh, so that some of these other ones probably would have been Amelia. I know. Yeah. So it's, I mean, the brief summary is we've been doing the CWPP, and this is a grant to continue that for the 2025 update. So. Um, okay. So. I don't have any answers to any questions. Anybody have any concerns about um, trying to get funding for that CWPP update? I think it is going to try to do more uh, downriver stuff, if not through this, but through the some of the Title III funding that we just approved. Yeah, I think some of the areas are like downriver and then Southern Trinity. That more significant effort needs to be done for updates. So that was Cal Fire funding for Southern Trinity, I think. Yeah. That CW could, could some update. of it be uh, do updates associated with um, last year's fires? Could be. We put that on the maps that Amelia's taking around. So can yeah. mm -hmm. Okay. So I think. Definitely the Fire Safe Council has supported CWPP planning. So um, that would make a logical letter of support for us. And then the third letter of support is a template approval. And that's for um, the fire risk reduction communities list. So um, CAL FIRE maintains a list of fire risk reduction communities. And basically, 
those are to be eligible, you are a taxing district of some sort and you have um, uh, certain planning or activities in place that show that you are um, actively trying to reduce fire risk in your community. Um, you have to apply to CAL FIRE to be designated one of these fire risk reduction communities. And if you are so designated, you um, move up in priority in their grants program. So um, right now we have, um, the Fire Safe Council has two entities that we know of that are trying to get this designation. One is um, the Hayfork um, Fire Protection District and the other is Trinity Center um, Community Services District. And so, um, the criteria are A, that you're a fire, that most of the of, of us would qualify for is A, you're a firewise community, and which, you know, we have what, 13 in Trinity County? 13 in Trinity County. And B, that you're a, an active participant in the community Wi Fi protection plan. So this letter confirms to um, CAL FIRE that those communities are active participants in the community wildfire protection plan process. So um, anyway, I, I think that's a pretty convoluted explanation of a simple thing, which is confirming that these um, entities participate in the CWPP. So uh, any, any questions about that? So who, what other special districts could qualify that haven't shown any, an interest? Weaverville, Fire Protection District? Weaverville, the county as a whole. The county could do it. Um, they're due April 1st. Yeah, Lewiston, right? Lewiston, Community Services District, yes. Um, Amelia sent out emails to all the CSDs in the county saying, yeah. you know, do you want to um, participate in this ranking? And I don't know, the county didn't respond. You know, who she, did she send it to Ed or? Um, I can check, but I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. Is there still time for someone to change the mind? Yes, for sure. Let's change our mind. Let's change our mind. Um, um, it's out. Does it take a board resolution or anything? Well, the, the application process is different for the um, non-county or city entities like the community services districts versus a county or city entity. I can send you the application form. You have to check for the non non-county, non-city entities. You have to check two boxes. The two boxes that most places in Trinity County that are CSDs can check are A, we're a firewise community, and B, we participate in the CWPP. For the county, it's, it might be a little bit more complicated, but you have the CWPP, that's one thing, but you have to have more than two out of seven. Hmm. But it does give you a higher ranking when you go to apply for grants from Cal Fire. So can I take a look at that with you? Yes. See what we can do about it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But to do April 1st. April 1st. We'll look quickly. We'll look quickly. Okay. So that's the other um, letter of support template approval. It, I apologize for that convoluted explanation. Does anybody have any questions or concerns about confirming that um, these entities are participating in the CWPP? No. Okay. If you're interested in getting more, learning more about it, let me know and I will email you the um, link to the application. Okay. So that's anybody know of any other grant applications that are 
I know the Cal Fire um, Rural Fire Capacity Grant applications are due May 4th. Um, I don't see any fire departments here this time. Um, anybody have any other grant applications that people might want to be notified of, interested in? Uh, this is Deborah from North Coast Air Quality. I've heard recently uh, about a grant program for clean air shelters, developing clean air shelters for communities. And um, a lot of OES departments, um, nonprofits are putting together grants to get these um, air purifiers to make clean air shelters for their rural communities. So if anybody's interested, I could find out more information about that if you'd like me to provide that. That would be great, Deborah. If you can send that to Amelia. Okay. Um, she'll put it in our newsletter. But yeah, because I was curious, we last year during the river complex, we took our, our HEPA filter and put it in the Odd Fellows Hall, but we didn't have the filters. Mm -hmm. we, we just had the machine. Mm -hmm. And um, it was not a good time of year to be trying to purchase mm -hmm. the filters. You know, they were like, Back order yeah, I could not find them. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's the kind of thing if we can find funding to have the filters and the filtration equipment, that would be awesome. Okay, I'll um, get that together and I'll send it on to Amelia. Um, I think it, it more involved getting the funding to get larger air purifiers and other equipment to establish a clean air shelter. But I'll get all the information and send it to Amelia. Yes, I think everybody could use that in their rural community. Do you have Ed Presley's email address? Um, I'll check. From the if county? I don't, if you want to put it in the chat, that's fine. Okay. Um, it's just E. Presley at Trinity. Yeah, because County OES may um, may want to. Oh. I'm sure. I'm sure they've already heard about it because it's a, been a big um, outreach. And I know Humboldt County OES is putting together something and so are the tribes over here. But I like to make sure Trinity is included. Yeah, we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so um, let's go ahead. It should be easy this time and do um, project updates. Um, just because we're a small group this month. So um, I don't see anybody from Cal Fire. So I think the, or Tom March is not on this time. Let's go ahead. Um, Basho, do you want to give us an update on what you're doing with the Lower Trinity River prescribed burn? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Uh, we are, we decided at our membership meeting, um, or was it our board, our directors meeting. Uh, recently, we nominated and elected uh, nine directors uh, to our board, which was very exciting um, because that, that implies support uh, from other humans. And that is fantastic. Um, during that meeting, uh, we, we consensus uh, voted to uh, delay uh, burn projects. Um, until the fall, uh, because of the uh, because of fire activity that we've seen uh, with uh, spotting fires from just uh, pile burns, um, and, and just the environmental uh, conditions uh, are not ideal for prescription um, understory burning in our neighborhood. So uh, we are going to put that off and continue to do pre treatments uh, and develop uh, neighborhood level uh, scale SMPs. Uh, with uh, Ms. Harris and um, yeah, burn plans and maps. I am also, uh, uh, we are acquiring ArcGIS and uh, the ability to uh, make our maps within that uh, uh, through online training. So I'm um, excited about that moving forward. And that's about all the news that's fit to print from our end. Thank you. Thanks. Did Blaze have anything to add? Uh, <laughs> Hi, uh, so the Fire Safe Council, stop. 
the fire safe council uh we've upped the chipper program uh they put in i think like 240 hours of volunteer work on south fork mountain this week alone uh so that's very exciting we have uh, a membership meeting coming up or electing another director and we are just sort of biding our time right now waiting to hear back to pull in the uh, emergency funds from cal fire while we kind of get our house in order so um that's kind of it for the fire safe council so um how did how did were you on the meeting um i guess with amelia about the willow creek fire safe council in terms of um coordinating with humboldt county and trying to get some uh funding and all that uh the one on monday yeah, um, yeah it it ended up being a little bit more of like an agency meet and greet um it was nice everybody seemed really uh really uh amenable it wasn't uh there wasn't a lot of talk of what planning would look like out here or what anybody would actually do so much as just sort of everyone familiarizing themselves with one another as we move forward so. more okay. to come so and and so you have you have an application in to Cal Fire for funding to help do a lot more of the um, down tree removal. Is that it? So Sabel Emmett uh, through Humboldt County Environmental Services uh, has submitted that grant on uh, our behalf. Um, portion of the funding would go towards creating a coordinator position within the Willow Creek Fire Safe Council. Um, in an effort to sort of, I don't know, build capacity and, uh, you know, it's, it's tricky because I feel like there's a lot of need out here and having a place for that for funding future funding and uh, to land is kind of uh, kind of the the idea. Um, but we would not be in charge of using these funds like we would just be the coordinator, um, the uh, Humboldt County office uh, merger uh, environmental services would actually be doing the contracting um, and I believe that would go out to bid. But we're not sure what it's going to look like because it hasn't come back yet. But I know that there was talk of perhaps the contracting going through Humboldt County RCD. We're just sort of waiting. Um, it's kind of hard. I don't like counting chickens, uh, so we're just we're just waiting. We're going to see what happens. Great. Okay. Anybody have any questions for Basho or Blaze? Okay, you guys are doing great work down there. Thank you very much. You're awesome. Thanks. Okay, um, let's see. NRCS, um, Aaron. So what's so you're leaving us? Do you have an idea when you're going to have a replacement? Yes, so there's going to be an acting district conservationist that starts next Monday, and her name is Taylor Friedrich, and so I can, I'll, I'll put her email address in the chat here. However, I have already um, indicated on my exit report that, uh, you know, when the frequencies of the Trinity County Fire Safe meetings occur, so that is going to be um, on on her radar to attend these meetings um, and so her detail is for 120 days and so until until the permanent position is filled and so that is um, in the works right now and it's uh, going through the HR process so I imagine at this moment they're probably in the hiring interview conducting interview stages. Um, so we will see who the final candidate is um, when it's officially announced. And so I have no no time frame, but it's estimated and hopeful that someone would be permanently in the seat um, by May. Great. Okay. Well, thank you for all your work you've done in Trinity County. Sorry, we haven't seen so much of you in perfect person. It's just kind of been that pandemic thing since you've been here. But thank you a lot. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I, I'm sure we'll continue to work all together in um, you know, the same similar capacities, but just maybe over on the other county line. So um, I will definitely continue to work and collaborate with like the, the Willow Creek Fire Safe Council and so forth, Lower Trinity Prescribed Burning Association, hopefully is my intent. And um, just, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm doing the same thing that I'm, I was doing in Trinity County, but over in Humboldt County and Del Norte counties now. So um, I was able to attend the call on Monday as well, and I got to virtually meet Blaze there. So hello again, Blaze. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, um, like she had mentioned, just moving forward, it, uh, it definitely seems like there's a lot of brainstorming and just awaiting uh, funding um, uh, announcements so that we can decide how to move forward with the next steps. And, and hopefully um, when these awards um, are granted, uh, then we can figure out how to execute and, and put some conservation dollars on the ground and continue to work all together. So with that being said, as far as EQIP um, specific updates, our last opportunity to receive uh, applications for completed um, conservation plans is on April 1st. So that is our sign up deadline. And then anything received after that date would just be considered for our FY23 cycle of funding. And so just to get a get a glimpse um, with what what's been going on. So we've been in general, we as an NRCS California have continuously, uh, we're just we're receiving a, a high quantity of applications statewide. And it's uh, it's just it's mostly a response to the the catastrophic wildfires that have been occurring across the state. And so uh, there's a lot of competition for, for funding potential and getting selected for, for EQIP contracts right now. Uh, we do have our Conservation Stewardship Program CSP application deadline on April 15th. And so that is available for qualified candidates um, for that program. And so um, I, I think moving forward, the best uh, way to hopefully secure future funding for Trinity County is to, to hopefully continue to submit uh, Joint Chiefs uh, initiative proposals and hopefully get selected for another three-year cycle because that, that showed that it was really I don't want to say much easier, but it definitely significantly reduced the competition for our local Trinity County applicants to basically just compete for funding among other Trinity County applicants, as opposed to having to compete for uh, on a statewide and also on a regional basis. So uh, I, that would be my, my recommendation to, to, for the Fire Safe Council, all of our partners, you know, with the Watershed Center, RCD, and so forth, is just continue to be advocates for the, the Joint Chiefs because that, again, um, provided a lot of uh, local opportunities for, for funding. Okay, we will do that. Um, anybody have any questions for Erin before she takes her leave? No, okay. Well, thank you very much, Erin. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, and I do see Tiffany on the call. So Tiffany, I'm not sure if there was anything that you wanted to add um, on behalf of NRCS or not, but I'm, uh, yeah, that was, that was, that concludes my report for NRCS. Thank Thanks, you, yeah, everyone. Good of the cause for Fire Safe Council, I'm think, um, in addition to report. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, Deborah, what's going on with the air quality management district? <laughs> Sorry, um, I drew a blank on Ed's name when we talked before. Um, I'm in smoke management plan land. I haven't transitioned over to wildfire land yet. So my contacts are kind of separated in those two things. 
I do have Ed's contact information and I have spoken with him intensely before during wildfire. Um, like I said, there's, uh, I've seen some uh, requests for, or wanting us to outreach for clean air shelters for rural communities and others that are interested. Um, right now, I'm in the process of gearing up for wildfire season, and uh, we're going to be making a pre-wildfire season uh, outreach plan like we do every year, which will get our um, information information about how we do our advisories and if you want to be on our mailing lists. Um, we continue to work on smoke management and provide burn authorizations to burners. Um, everybody right now is kind of waiting for a little rain. So that has slowed down just a little bit. I assume after this next rain, things are going to pick up quite a bit. And then depending on precipitation, um, we could see a real early fire season this year. I'm, as always, I'm open if anybody needs anything from me on smoke management or if you have any um, suggestions on things we can do to make things easier to get burning done over there. And that's what I have right now. Thank you. Okay. All right. Any questions for Deborah? Yep, I think we're all hoping for more rain. Um, Definitely. Yeah. Okay, so I don't really have any report for the volunteer fire department for Trinity Center. Um, Trinity Center, Trinity County Board of Supervisors. I don't have anything. Okay, any questions for Jill? Nope, okay. Um, how about the collaborative, Pat? So I would just say we had our, our most recent collaborative meeting was Friday of last week. And uh, I think it was a really good positive. We're kind of in this kind of resetting our, our goals and our relationship with the Forest Service in particular, Shasta Trinity, because they have essentially all new leadership. And I think it was a pretty positive meeting. Uh, we're going to schedule a couple of field trips in April 1 to a project called the, the West Side Plantation Thin Project, where there's kind of concerns that when they implemented earlier portions of that project, the Forest Service through a contractor, they did a great job meeting the prescription, except for the last step, which is cleaning up the slash. It always seems to be the piece that doesn't get dealt with. And um, when the uh, fire came through last summer, um, all that slash meant that, that all that great prescription was for not because it pretty much burned everything up because of the heat from the slash. So we're going to look at that and try to figure out how to refine, you know, that that work um, and that prescription for the next phase of the, of that major project, and um, and then the pilot project, which is the, the project we've been working on since 2014, is getting close to having a signed decision. So the second field trip will be out to portions of that pilot project. These are both in the South Fork kind of area. Um, with the eye, with the eye towards actually doing not with paint but with uh, flagging tape, do some sample marks of the prescription to make sure that everybody understands the prescription, especially the people who are going to be doing the mark for the four cells, so that there's not some miscommunication. I think that's probably the, the main thing that came up, and they do, and, and maybe Tim will talk about this, but. You know, forever, you know, the Fire Safe Council's biggest problem with the Forest Service is they never had money to do projects. But the money is showing up, you know, between the infrastructure bill, you know, and, you know, post-fire kind of recovery money. The question now is, will they be able to staff up? Or will they be able to use third parties to kind of get the work done? So that's kind of, I think, the essence of the project. Okay, any questions for Pat about the collaborative meeting? Okay, so I'll turn it over to the RCD for an update. Um, so I'll speak at least for the, the poor self side of things. 
we have our four crews running and we've been doing some work on BLM land with BLM funding out in the Rush Creek area, just off of Rush Creek Road. Just the standard kind of prescription stuff, cut and pile, which they'll eventually burn. Uh, we did some work in Weaverville behind the, the local Mormon church. We had a, a Cal Fire grant, a fire prevention grant that started in 2017 that has just had a couple more days that we rather spend spend in the field than on on reporting and so we we finished up that grant and so that's all done but we were able to get some good work done behind the mormon church in town just a, just a couple acres of work but right in the center of town is pretty solid and then uh the bulk of the crew time has been spent out in the uh, reading indian creek area on blm land that's with our forest health cal fire grant and so they're treating, trying to treat 50 acres out there with of cut and pile. And I, I think they've got around 15 or so acres done at this point. And the last the last week and this week, we're pretty busy for our crew for training. So I think we got like eight guys through the, uh, the basic 32 to get their red card. And then we also did the refresher of which we had five guys who needed the refresher. And this was put on by the watershed center. And so we got them refreshed and then new people red carded. So our entire four cell staff of like 18 people is almost entirely red carded. And then they're going to do another course in June. So hopefully at that point, we'll be able to fill in the gaps and have an entirely, you know, fire ready crew, whether that be prescribed fire and hopefully not wildfire, because that's not really something we want to focus on. But if, uh, if it comes to call, you know, at least we'll have calls to make that a possibility if needed. And then the uh, a bunch of us also went through the advanced, it's called S131, and that's to become a firefighter type one under the, the current system so to be a squad leader. So we were able to put a bunch of our guys through that training as well, which is pretty exciting because we haven't really had that opportunity before that we could actually fund. And that was also through the watershed center. And then we've uh, been contracting the watershed center using their masticator under our Forest Health Grant, and they masticated around 30 acres in the Reading and Indian Creek area. And then with BLM funding, we wanted to keep the masticator going, keep them consistent work. And so we subcontracted again with the Watershed Center, and they did some work in Lewiston, and they're currently out in Lewiston, and they hopefully will get a total of around 25 acres or so masticated in the next week or two. Uh, and then I've had some conversations with uh, some some of the Forest Service about expanding our program into the more technical realm for the forestry services because they've you know had hiring troubles and just to expand that capacity to do some of the layout and some of the more timber side whether that's the silviculture and the plantations and you know site prep type of stuff or whether it's you know timber sale layout stuff and so some of those conversations we're having, and it seems highly likely based on some of the, the funding that's coming into play that we'll be able to help them out as a third party to get some more work done on the land and a more less chainsaw fuels kind of stuff, but some of the more initial planning. And so hopefully that'll that'll work out, but that's super early. That's just, just kind of coming out this week. So we'll see where that goes and I'll update as appropriate. So. Cool. Great. Okay, any any questions for Chris? Um, do you have the community chipping days scheduled in May? I do not have them in front of me, but I think they've basically been decided. And uh, Amelia has those and we can get those sent out or have them at the next meeting or something. Too. Or I think they're we could probably post them on the website or make it so they're more widely known. Like starting generally in like May or I think we're yeah, we're planning on it's like gonna be like the first Tuesday of every May is gonna be like a community. So like the you know, up by the lake, Trinity Center, Covington Mill area will be like, you know, the third Tuesday or and then Weaverville Douglas City would be the first. And if there's which hopefully there are enough people sign on, like we have the ability to expand that into Wednesday into Thursday if the need is there. Right. So it'd be good to give people lots of warning because yeah, they gotta do the cutting like stuff. Parts like us, I mean, take me a while. One chain, of, one one tank of chainsaw gas a day. Is yeah, all, yeah. All we can do, you know, so it takes a while to develop a 
I'm sure we'll be yeah advertising that in the paper and on social media and on our website yeah. and through email. Yeah, no, oh. it's, I think this the sooner the better for that. Yeah, so that's a good, good point. Who do you predominantly work with when you're having those expanded work conversations with the core services at Terra? Or uh, I've been talking to I guess below Terra. I've been talking to Kelly McElroy of the she works out of the SO down in Reading. She's a forestry. Yeah, kind of. I'd say kind of forestry lead or something. Yeah, so she's kind of. She's our ecosystem staff officer. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So she's the she's an equivalent of Tara at the SO level. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. And I don't know their system. So. <laughs> and then. <clears throat> So the the Title Three money that you got, I mean, that still has to come through the county, uh, you know, uh, CAO's office to get you that money, that agreement. But that does that add to the community chipping days? Um, it would, yeah, it'll expand on those days, and it some of that I think just based on timeline might not be available for this May, but you know maybe it'll be I'll be surprised, but I doubt it. And so the, uh, but we have, we have other funding, so. Likewise, I mean, you've got chipping grant that was approved by the Title II RAC. Yep, so we have RAC chipping. Which is, yeah. Still. Somewhere in the pipeline. Yeah, we have RAC, we have a, the current stuff, if the RAC's not here in time, Title III's not here in time, we have uh, CAL FIRE fire prevention, which we've specifically written in community chipping because we, the more that we can do and provide the, the better and the more empowering to other people to have less of an excuse not to do work. So. so do you guys, I mean, have other communities? I mean, I'm not sure which communities are on the schedule, but um, so what I think I'm hearing is that if you have places like down in the, you know, western part of the county where you want shipping where you guys haven't already been doing a lot of the storm stuff um you should let chris know yeah yeah i mean we did a ton down there and they're on the schedule again for because more will be accumulated for sure so okay all right we need to get the word out about that so I'll yeah we can with work amelia. With, with amelia and maya to kind of we just don't want to uh, this is dina I have a question also. Yeah, go. Um, my question, my question is, um, on March twelfth, we had a Salyer community meeting, and Amelia gave us some on a slide. She gave us some statistics about the chipping that had been done down here, and. Um, she was able to put some kind of a formula together that said, you know, essentially 91 acres had been, um, the fuels had been reduced and over $11,000 of work had been done by volunteers. And, and so she had like this accountability piece. And um, how do you come up with those? Because our Fire Safe Council could utilize that kind of information to you know, we, we, we keep track, but, you know, is there a formula you have? And is yeah. like when you come out and you do a day's chipping out here, how much does it cost the RCD to come out and do that chipping? You right. know, like, how does that build into the formula also? So the, uh, at least the, I think the numbers she was speaking to were basically when you fill out the community chipping form, there's a, uh, we have the, the landowner give us some basic information on how many hours they spent doing the work as well as what their estimated treatment area is. And so if the landowner like, you know, treated half an acre on their yard and it took them 10 hours, we just, we just total those up from all the forms of all the areas we chipped. And then we just assume, I think typically it's 25 bucks an hour for a, a landowner to do that work. And so I think those are the totals. So it's not it's not any kind of really formula. It's just just addition, and uh, and our cost of doing that work I don't think was in that in those numbers. So Dina, the, the that dollar amount for volunteer time is something that's derived every year from the U.S. Department of Labor statistics has uh, 
a, a, a value that they give to different kinds of volunteer work, whether it be you know, manual labor kind of work, or if you were a, an architect or an engineer and you were donating your time to some project, they have established dollar uh, hourly rates that are used to, uh, to come up with that, that value. Thanks. So, so this week, um, there's been some shipping going on on South Fork Road, and um, there have been a couple of ways that it's been documented. And um, one is just in numbers, like yesterday, they did, or Tuesday, they did shipping, and there were 13 volunteers. And so we, what we would do is calculate the number of hours that they spent the number of volunteers times the number of hours times the wage um, is how it's calculated. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and and like Pat said, if you Google um, the value of volunteer time, um, this Bureau of Labor Statistics will come up, and it's like twenty five dollars and forty two cents for unskilled labor kind of thing. So. Um, yeah, and we use that in our grant applications all the time. Say, you know, we're going to match the grant money you give us with X number of hours of volunteer time, and it's worth, you know, Y dollars. So, so that's pretty easy to figure out. And I'm sure well, the reason I'm asking, the reason I'm asking is we have a Humboldt Area Foundation grant um, for the PBA and um accounting for the volunteer hours is something i'm trying to figure out which is outside of fire safe council but it sounds like i could use the same format to do the those kinds of calculations correct yep. yeah that's what we that's what we do when we report our uh submit our grant reports to the humboldt area foundation that's exactly what we do okay thank you and you just and uh, the, what about the RCD? The uh, so so some of it in, as far as the accounting side, like so there's a reason we have every landowner we're going to chip on fill out this form because that's our documentation. So that's that's something that shows you know what a landowner wrote. And so you know then when we're talking to a grantor, we're like, hey, we have this much time. They're like, how'd you get that number? And we have a you know a stack of fifty forms. And so that's <clears throat> yeah, I guess. How it is. so it's it's pretty powerful on on grants to be able to provide that match that otherwise you know we don't really have financially but if it's volunteers and you guys seem to have them you know pretty dialed in over there so and I think but, if you but need then to... the question I'm asking is okay you have volunteer hours and then you mm -hmm. have the hours of the people who are getting paid how do you calculate yeah. that into the the grant reporting how much did you spend uh i mean we we track hours and we have a fiscal manager who does payroll but no could you could you tell them how much money you spent doing a project down there oh so i mean we have like rough estimates and then i mean it comes out ultimately like once you calculate benefits and work with common all that but so we know like you know our a 10 hour day for our a four man crew is roughly $1,300 with their benefits and everything. And then the cost of the chipper and maintenance and stuff is, you know, around 250. And then for the mileage, you know, we know the mileage, the federal mileage rate is point, it's 58.5 cents. So, I mean, those are, those are just kind of known costs. But if, if, if you did a five days down in, in the down river area and mm -hmm. Dina needed that data, she could ask you for mm -hmm. that. How much did you guys did it cost for you guys yep. to do five days? Yep. Yeah, we could get any kind of number. So you can reach out to me direct, Dina, and I can I can help clarify or provide anything that you guys might need. That would be great because we're we're can trying to I'm trying to figure that out for this grant right now. I, I will contact you. Thank you. Okay. okay, so Dina, actually you're I think you're up next. As far as what the tribe might be doing, do you guys have any updates, maybe on Ironside or anything else? Um, no updates on Ironside. Somebody tried to go up the backside of Ironside um, this week, and they were stopped a couple miles from the top because of snow still. So 
Nothing's happening on our side, which is a good thing um, until um, the Forest Service uh, and we um, meet and, and figure out you know, how, to, how to move forward. As far as other things, the, um, uh, there's, there, are, there are lots of things going on down here. Um, primarily what we're focused on right now is trying to, to figure out how to participate in um, organizations like, like the Trinity County Fire Safe Council, the PBA, and weigh in and, and have a voice in, within those organizations. We've been doing that at the agency level for many years, but now because of the conditions that are here, we're try, we are trying to um, make our voice heard, like the, the, the people on South Fork who are tri tribal people we're informing the PBA and we want to inform RCD. You know, these are tribal people who, who need um, to, you need to ensure that, um, that they are included in whatever the plans are and, and how, that, how that relationship works out is, is something that we're working on, um, particularly with the PBA and Fire Safe Council at this point. Okay, well, thank you for hanging in there then during our meetings. And um, hopefully, yeah, now that you know the contacts with Chris and Basho and whoever else, you know, um, we definitely welcome your input. So however we can help. Thank you. Um, okay, Tim, um, it's Thanks for hanging in there also. So I'm gonna turn it over to you to let us know what's going on with the Shasta Trinity. Yeah, uh, thanks for uh, uh, having us back. It's been a while since we've been here. Uh, we've been uh, running at a frank, frantic pace over the last couple of months. And so I know it's, it's probably been five months since I've been to one of these meetings. So, uh, I'll start off uh, with some of the just uh, normal things, I guess, that are going on. Um, we're going to have a pod workshop with the North Coast Resource Partnership uh, on April 5th. And so pod is potential operational delineation. And so uh, over the past few years, uh, spatial analysis has got a lot better in the fire world. Um, we uh, we had, took a first crack at this maybe uh nine years ago eight years ago or so uh and we just kind of stuck to the watershed boundaries uh when we did that so uh with the changing of our ability to analyze um and the complex terrain we work in uh that workshop is really going to help us kind of narrow in where we could be focusing some of our our fuels work some of our efforts in the fire suppression world and so that ties into the presentation that you guys did last uh, last month, uh, which I'm sorry I missed, but I had actually I had already talked with Dylan about it, so I was kind of aware uh, how that those tools could be used. Uh, so again, that's on April 5th, and it's going to be over in Hayfork, um, and and I expect to see some uh, draft information come out about how we're going to analyze those uh, operational delineations uh, in the future. Uh, local fire agreements with the volunteer fire departments, the, the regional office has said, hey, we, we do need to focus on this and make it right. So um, if they haven't contacted the local departments, that's probably coming here real quick. Uh, so that can all get squared away and ironed out before this next fire season. Um, I think they realized that there was just, that the decisions that were made were not incorporating the local uh, things going on. So, uh, so that should be coming out and I don't know what is coming out of it, but I know that there's, uh, some seats at the table to re-engage in discussions. 
Um, the rack projects, uh, Title II, Pat mentioned, uh, I am working on the domestic grant for the chipping program. I was told to hold off a little bit on Guy Covington. There was some information that was still needed back. So, Chris, you're laughing. Uh, so that's waiting on you guys to get ah. that back. But then I'll work on it as soon as I get it back uh, in the list of many other things that I'm working on. Uh, the Bowerman Project, the Watershed Center is... Uh, is out doing some uh, good survey work on that project and is hoping to, to keep moving that forward. Um, in line with Bowerman is also a project that the uh, Shasta Lake National Recreation Area is working on called Trinity Camps. And so that Trinity Camps project is about 850 acres um, and it's gonna address the fuels around a majority of the campgrounds within the Trinity NRA. Uh, and so that's going to start down at Stony Point and go up the lake shore. It will pick up or is proposed to pick up um, the treatment around Ridgeville, which the community there has been asking for for a few years. And uh, Laura, prior to her retirement, and I have been banging the drum for that one uh, for quite some time. So hopefully with the Trinity Camps project, um, we'll be able to get some things moving forward. And so there's a draft project initiation letter uh, that I just received the other day. We have a field trip coming up for that, I believe on April 1st. And so um, still very early in the phase of what we're trying to do, but really uh, some of the ri biggest risks we have is fires escaping campgrounds uh, along the lake, especially as, as we have more and more dead and dying material so we'll remove the hazards, reduce the fuels around the campgrounds, and hopefully uh, secure some of those areas a little bit. Um, moving forward, the Petty John project, we are uh, starting to look at what we can do out there on the fuels side. So the first portion of that is uh, going to be a fuel break that we put in from Lewiston at the New Bridge all the way up to the turn off to the Hella Base, skipping over the, the private, obviously, and some of the areas that have less needs. So that project's about 166 acres. It was submitted to contracting a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and I would anticipate work to start on that project in uh, mid-June, uh, maybe early July at the latest. Um, just as a catch up on reporting for the Weaverville Community Forest, we burned about 280 acres or treated through mastication about 280 acres within the Weaver Basin uh, during this last prescribed fire season. Uh, we have some more mastication that we're hoping to get accomplished this year, uh, waiting some uh, State Historic Preservation Office reports to come back on those and then uh, if the moisture comes in we're going to take a swing at probably our last five to six acres of pile burning this year uh, and that'll be the stuff right above the highway below the beans property um, just trying to get that last piece locked in uh, once the uh, wildlife crews complete their surveys for goshawks and spotted owls we will get our contract crews back into glenison gap and uh, on the low gap fuel break to finish those pieces uh, this year. And so there's, I think there's about 130 acres left between those two uh, to get completed. Um, that's what I have for projects. I just wanna hit on the Barney fire uh, from a couple of weeks ago. So uh, that there was some speculation or reporting that that fire was associated with uh, pile burning or prescribed fire, uh, and I, I will say it's under investigation, but it was not associated with any kind of land management activity for that fire. So um, it had probably been burning for a week by the time it was discovered, and just due to the remote area, there was nobody, uh, nobody that really saw it until it put up a smoke column large enough to be seen. Uh, 31 acres was the final size. Uh, well, the last check on it a few days ago, there was still like one stump hole smoldering in the middle of it. Um, and I think we're just gonna let the weather kind of take care of that last stump hole. Um, so that should, uh, that should wrap up that fire. Um, we are staffing an engine seven days a week. So we do have folks available to respond 
um, every day. This time, and that's not normal this time of year. So that that is an indicator of how dry uh, things are out there. Um, that's what I have for the Trinity River Management Unit. I, I didn't get anything back from the South Fork. Um, so if you guys have any questions, I know I threw a lot of stuff out there, but uh, please, if any questions, go ahead. Um. Yeah, Pat has questions. So how are we doing on the community forest maintenance phase two? Uh, the Tara's hope and intention is that we have that decision signed this fall. Uh, we do need some help with uh, ARC surveys, I believe. We're, we're looking into that. Um, and there's a, there's a couple of other small pieces. There's many folks out on details right now, so we don't have botany. Right now, we have a two detailed archaeologists, so hopefully we can get some of that stuff uh, in the works. And um, yeah, so I'm hoping that at that point, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask for some small revisions on what we had originally planned there to include a little bit more mastication than we had originally looked at, uh, just in some of the brush fields when I went out and did a just a brief tour of those. Uh, we we wouldn't be able to get back in there without masticating first. Uh, we couldn't hold fire on those lines. So we need to be able to treat some of those again before we uh, would implement prescribed fire. Um, so uh, Pat, you mentioned, and, and some other folks mentioned the infrastructure bill. So um, yeah, potential, and I, I use the word potential. There's potential for a lot of money to come our way. Um, so we're not actually seeing it, but we're hearing about it. So we're trying to plan up for what it looks like if that money comes in. There's also disaster recovery money that may be coming or is probably more likely to come to the forest right now uh, to deal with some of the stuff within the monument and the river complex. So um, one of the things that we're taking a strong look at right now is uh, road maintenance. So uh, fixing culverts that are damaged by the fires, getting road surfaces back up to a good condition, uh, mitigating fuels uh, and hazard trees that are along the, the side of the road. Um, and so just within the monument on the Trinity River side, I think the analysis I did, we're looking at about 300 and some miles of road that, that we're gonna be trying to get cleaned up, repaired and, and hazard trees mitigated. Um, the river complex is significantly less just due to the nature on our forest of where the fire was at. So the majority, I think it's only 26 acres and the majority of that's Coffee Creek Road um, on federal land. There's a significant chunk of that is private. And I so I think question. $20 million is what we were, the number that I've seen thrown around there. So I, I don't know where that's going to fit in, but um, yeah. I have a question. This is Dina Magdaleno. Yeah. Um, the, on the Monument Fire, what happened was the Forest Service closed Grays Creek and Hennessy, and it was the, those two roads are escape routes for people um, who were cut off in Burnt Ranch and also for people who are on South Fork. That's the alternate way to get out. And have you gone and scoped it out and looked at the state of those roads? Are you doing anything collaboratively with Six Rivers about those roads? Because there was a lot of work that was done back on the, um, the road behind um, the Big Bar area, but I didn't, I don't think any work was done to keep the road open on Hennessy, Hennessy runs across the ridge and connect, jumps down into South Fork, and it also connects to Gray's Creek. And those roads are, um, they actually become main routes when the road is closed going in either direction. Have you done any um, scoping of that area at all? So the almost the majority of those two roads falls on the six rivers. And so we we supported them by providing a chipper to do some work. Um, and we've been help we were helping them early on. Um, but for the disaster recovery money, it's 
it's associated with the fire and not with the storm damage we received uh, around Christmas there. So, uh, so we haven't done a lot of looking in that area. We we got the roads opened up and some uh, with like the grader and stuff across the top of Underwood Mountain. Uh, but as far as down into those drainages, it's mostly the six rivers that's uh, attacking that project. And I don't know in what form they're doing that. Uh, Basho, in his detail, may have a better idea of what's uh, going to go on out there in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, so Dana, we don't have um, a, a ranger from Six Rivers on the call. So um, we might have to see if we can get them to you know, answer that question for you. Well, we have, um, we are setting up a meeting with Six Rivers. I was asking about Shasta Trinity because Burt Ranch is clearly in Shasta Trinity and um, during the monument fire, that, that back route was closed as well as the front route. And so um, the portion of Hennessy, Underwood that are in Shasta Trinity, is there any plans on your part to do anything other than to chip alongside the road? Uh, so there's the, eventually there's the Burt Ranch project. Um, and so that's not an answer for right now in the moment, but that's still uh, a planning process that's going on uh, to treat that area as a whole. And so we're trying to figure out how to repackage that with the, the change conditions out there from when it was originally looked at, the cooperation between Willow Creek Fire Safe Council, the Trinity County Fire Safe Council, and the Forest Service. And so there's, there's been some dynamic changes uh, in there. Uh, over the time. Uh, so we're, we're looking at how we can try to, to rebuild that. Um, as far as the immediate get in there and do work, it's, it's mostly going to be the chipping that we can do if it's outside of the fire area or a road that was altered because of the fire area, I guess is the way to say it. Like if we were running dozers down it as a contingency line, we could probably go back in. But the storm damage, it's you know, we're limited by the NEPA that we have. And so we can we can probably treat the roadsides with the folks that we have available um, within fire. But, you know, we're also, uh, you know, I, I hate to bring this up, but, you know, folks need to be aware. We're probably going to be only staffing four of the six engines on our unit this year because that's what we have available and what we're able to hire. So we're, we're really short staffed right now. Um, on our suppression modules, and it'll uh, that all limits our capacity to pick up those extra projects. And folks don't want to hear that. It's it's not that it's not an easy thing to say, and it's certainly not an easy thing to hear. Uh, but it's you know if if we don't get money to do those contracts, then we have to do them in house. But if we don't have the folks in house to do them, then we can only chip away as much as we can on those those types of projects. A question, Mary. Is there any money in your uh, budget this year for anything on our side? Um, I, I'm not sure. I haven't really been in, engaged on the conversations for Ironsides other than I know that they're uh, trying to, like, I know we need to do the cleanup up there uh, of the lookout post fire, get some of that stuff cleaned up. And then I just, I know they're looking at a spot for a, a radio tower where we can set up a temporary repeater for the year. And, and that's about the limit of the conversations I've had. It's, um, it's going on at a different air level than, than I'm being engaged at. The reason I asked that, Tim, is because we get asked about Ironside and what's going on with Ironside as a tribe. But one of the things that I want to state clearly is it's not within our control. It's within the control of the Forest Service, not the Sunungwe tribe. And, and I, want, I want to be very clear that, that we cannot answer those questions. And um, we haven't even had a sit down meeting with the Shasta Trinity about any of this. And, 
Uh, it's the same for us. The only thing that we are aware of is the goal to put in a temporary translator and to get up to the top of the mountain to begin the clean up of the hazardous waste that's up there. And so I'm not, I, my intention is not to be rude to you, but to be clear to the people from Trinity County that the Sonongway Council does not have any control here over what the Forest Service does or does not do uh, on Ironside. And we haven't had any meetings. We know as much as you do about what the intention of the Forest Service is on Ironside. And I, it's hard to have to answer those questions all the time when we, know, we don't know anything. Yeah, I, I wish I could give an answer there, but like I said, that at whatever level the conversation is happening with regards to the replacement of the lookout locations, stuff like that, it's uh, it's not happening at a level where that information is coming to me. I know we've made some recommendations, but uh, where they go from there, it's, uh, like I said, it, there's a whole nother level of conversation that's going on that that we are not privy to. So that, that's a good point to make, Dina. I appreciate that. Um, so we will um, assume that people with a higher pay grade than the Fire Safe Council are going to be communicating with the tribe as far as you know how to how to best you know um, address any concerns about Ironside. Um, okay, I, I think are you done, D Dina? Do you have any other questions? No, I don't. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think Jill had a question. I do. Hey, Tim. You so you said that you're staffing an engine seven days a week right now. I'm assuming that's based in Weaverville. Um, it's actually the big bar engine that's staffing seven days a week, but we'll move them wherever the need is located for the weekend. So uh, the Weaverville or Mule Creek engine is uh, staffed Monday through Thursday. And then the big bar engine is staffed Thursday through Sunday. Okay. And then when you move to staffing four of the six, do those move around two or do you know where they're going to be? Um, so it's likely that we will have an engine in Burt Ranch, Big Bar, Weaverville, and either Mule Creek or Coffee Creek, depending on where they go. And it, it'll be the same kind of thing, not to downplay, uh, but the, the risk of fire right now in Big Bar is gonna be low for the next couple of years. Um, there's potential for roadside starts, but if it moves through the grass, it's gonna get into a burned area and probably stall out pretty rapidly on its own. So we will, we will likely as uh, duty chiefs move the engines to where our biggest threat is. So bring one into Junction City, uh, just because of the risk that still exists going up Canyon Creek, uh, you know, the whole south of Coffee Creek down through the lake, there's still a risk there. The east side of the lake, the, the fuels uh, within the car fire are now getting it to back to a level where they're a little bit more receptive to fire spread. Uh, maybe still a, a little bit of a buffer, but it, it's coming back. So those are going to be the areas that we'll probably focus our efforts on uh, and our resources this year, if especially if we're limited. There is some potential with this next round of, of fire hire that is uh, getting ready to begin, I think next week, that we can hire a couple more folks and we'll at least be able to get one more of the engines back up. Um, but we had two, two engine captains that left the agency for various reasons this last year. Um, we, we have folks that are leaving to go back to home for other opportunities within the agency. And so it's just right now we're, you know, we're kind of on the, the far end of the state. Uh, and as bad as it is here, uh, the Modoc National Forest may only be able to staff six engines on the whole forest this year. So if we can stop four on our unit, but they only get six for the forest, it's, um, yeah, we're as bleak as it looks, we're a lot better off than many folks. Um, on the hiring note, uh, the fuels planner, Vice Lara, uh, was approved to fill. They are working through the process and then 
I think they're doing the hiring consultation sometime next week for it. Uh, but what we, because we could not fill the position at the full performance of the duty, we'll fill it as a developmental position. So it's probably somebody that will come in that has the degree that's required for the position. And then over time, they will be required to get the qualifications on the fire side to do the job. So it'll really probably be like a three to five year process to get that person fully up to speed. And, and I do know that we had some candidates on that list. So um, my hope is that we can hire that position uh, sometime and have somebody in place to, um, maybe by the fall. Okay, and then just one last question. You had said when you talked about the local agreements with the fire departments that your statement was they realized that they were um, not making these decisions you know, and incorporating what's happening locally. And you said there's still some seats at the table to re-engage in that discussion. Who goes to the yeah. table? So maybe I can give an update on that, Tim. Um, so, you know, Trinity Center, Volunteer Fire Department and the Fire Chiefs Association had sent a letter to Representative Huffman and um, Randy Moore and Secretary Vilsack about the concern about the cooperative agreements. And so I had a uh, conference call that was scheduled uh, for yesterday as a result of Representative Huffman's office. Um, but on um, Monday, I talked to Alex McBath. So Alex had talked to the forest supervisor and conveyed our concerns and asked me and Marty Mather as the president of the Fire Chiefs Association if we would agree to go back to the four hours initial attack um, with it being reimbursable after four hours. That's kind of the agreement that chiefs had a, agreed to earlier and had signed and then the Forest Service last August changed it to not reimbursable. Um, anyway, I, I told um, Alex, we would be happy to go back to the agreement we had signed. And so um, Rachel Berkey was going to um, request a letter of deviation from be approved from Washington. So um, we're supposed to hear back um, hopefully by April 4th, which is our next fire chiefs meeting if Washington has approved that. Um, and if they have, then we'll be, we'll be back where we were essentially a year ago with um, some of the department signing and you know starting to work on our operations plans and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's definitely moving forward and definitely um, I think they heard us um, you know, saying why Trinity should be um, a little different than the national standard. Does that help? Yeah, I think that that's, there's more information that you had there that I was unaware of. So uh, the, the meetings and whatnot. So yeah, I think that captures it uh, quite well. Yeah, for once being the squeaky wheel um, worked. So, um, is that yeah, yeah. yeah. So I have a Tim and Chris question. Yes. So um, Tim, you were describing that phase one fuel break for Petty John from the new bridge up. And uh, yes. We actually have to skip the private lane. And my curiosity was whether or not there was a possibility that the RCD had funding that could maybe work with those private landowners, you know, because the fuel break only good is its continuity. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think you want to go through uh, Pine Cove Marina. They're pretty, pretty tightly packed in there. That's the private piece. Oh, okay. That's the private piece. Okay. Yeah. And then there's a little bit right at uh, Lakeview Terrace, and they've done a pretty decent job of cleaning their, their property up. So it's really just those two little uh, skiffs. Okay. Um, across there. So that's, it's disconnected, obviously, from on a full linear scale, but it's not really a spot that needs to be treated. Okay, thanks. 
So, so I have some uh, North Lake questions. Um, were you planning on doing doing any more prescribed burning in the ballpark? Oh boy, that's uh, that's a tough question. Uh, the the first answer is yes. The second answer is my gosh, if we don't get any precipitation, the unintended consequences of even low intensity fire may have a bigger impact on the mortality in there than we would like to see. So um, Lake Forest Plantations and North Lake are both spots that I'm looking at. I wanted to try to get about 45 to 50 acres um, again there at, at North Lake. Um, especially north of the road that comes in up past the cemetery where it didn't really burn as clean as we wanted it to the first time. I just, I'm not sure that we won't have mortality at a level that's unacceptable with how dry it's been. Okay, yeah, that makes perfect sense. So I just wanted to be able to answer people's questions if, if I get that question. So. Yeah, it's on the table, but conditions are just really not suitable. So, okay. Um, so have you guys talked about the, um, the road to the Bowerman boat ramp? So at the end of Guy Covington Drive, um, Tara had said that this spring you'd be able to um, brush along that road. Um, any, any idea what might be going on there? Yeah, so uh, I actually just had a conversation uh, this morning about that road. And so Recreation has that uh, small excavator, a Caterpillar 305 with a mowing head on it. And they were going to tackle all of that work. But uh, I, uh, and I, when I said it this morning, I said, we promised them we'd have it done by the end of March. And so we got one week to get it done and it's not going to be done because that math, that machine has been committed to rebuilding the campgrounds out in Forest Glen. So it's on the list. Uh, and, I, and I hate to say that because I've told many people today that it's on the list of stuff to do and we haven't got to it yet. So, um, you know, we have folks that are on the East Coast right now supporting fire operations out there. So even locally with staffing seven days a week, our workforce is, uh, is stretched fairly thin. Uh, and then add the commitment to folks doing hiring. It's, we're, we're at about stretched out about as thin as we can get right now for our folks. And we got snow surveys coming up next week, which I don't know how we're going to get done. <laughs> um, so yes, it's on the list. Uh, and I will continue to push that project forward when they get the piece of equipment back from Forest Glen. Okay, well, you just, you might let Tara know that when she's up in Trinity Center for the community meeting on the 5th, that's she's gonna be asked, I know. That's probably a question she'll get. Just yeah. So she has a heads up. Yeah. Um, and then the, the last question I had is kind of both for you and Chris. So, um, um, Guy Covington, so where really is that at? Do you know, Chris? Uh, so I can speak to just, I guess, as much as I know is uh, we, there were some issues with it that, you know, Tara had. And so I adjusted things within the original proposal and then resubmitted those adjustments that should have, should have buttoned it up. And it, my, I impression was that it was good to go. So it, it just got stuck somewhere along the way or it just hasn't. So this is just recently? Uh, I think it was last Monday. Okay. It was, yeah, as soon as I got it, I, I turned it around you know, within a couple hours, but. And sent it to Tara? Yeah, it was, I think you were emailed too. But... No, I didn't get a copy of an email. Okay. Oh, uh, make well, sure it got out of his RCD shop. I know, I know I sent it to who I was supposed to, so I don't know <laughs> where it went from there. I can uh, follow up. Yeah. So the last word I had was don't touch it until we give you the thumbs ups. And they were waiting on RCD to provide some revisions. So I'm, I'm working on the chipping grant, but um, yeah. that one, 
um, and we'll, it'll just be an SPA. So it should be fairly quick to process it. Kelly provided me some of the information, but um, our, our grants and agreements deadline is May 25th this year, but we certainly don't want to wait that late to get those submitted. Yeah, because I, I had an email from Tara that once she had the revised numbers, um, and this was before the meeting with Kelly, that um, she would try to put it at the top of the list for grants and agreements so that at least the intersection, you know, part could be done before fire season, even if this, the parts that are along Highway 3 aren't done. So um, anyway, just... Just so we're all kind of in the loop on that one that I was just trying to figure out where everybody was. So it sounds like Chris needs to check and make sure that the information went to the Forest Service. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty certain it did, but okay. I will uh, follow it up and, and make sure that it uh, left our, our building, so. And, and thanks, Tim. I know you just needed another project to, to <laughs> Put on. Yeah, yeah, there's only like a hundred balls to keep in the air right now. So what's one more? Thank you. Okay. Um, any, any other things for Tim and Shasta Trinity? Any questions? Yes. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Deborah. I just had a question about another ball in, in Tim's uh, universe. Uh, I'm kind of just kind of looking for information on, you know, what you see manpower wise, condition wise, pre for prescribed burning between now and the suspension. Cause I'm just um, trying to allocate my resources. Yeah, so uh, we should have some, we should have some staffing uptick here in the next couple of weeks as we bring back some of our permanent seasonal employees. So I anticipate that we bring on, I think about 10 folks in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and what, as we get those, we will look at opportunities. Um, and they're probably gonna be smaller units, Deb, within the Weaver Basin okay. or, uh, or even out at North Lake, if I can find in Trinity Center, if I can find that right piece of ground that uh, the soil moisture's there and everything else kind of falls into place. So I don't, I don't think we're going to do large burns, but we, I certainly want to take advantage of as many burn days as we can mm -hmm. uh, to treat the landscape in, in advance of what could be another uh, problematic fire year. Um, I'm mainly looking at beginning of June. Um, I, I'm going to try to take some vacation and I'm um, if, if you, I kind of, my crystal ball's kind of really blurry, but um, I'm kind of thinking that the suspension's going to come in early this year, earlier than usual, but I didn't know if, if I know if. So um, the, the CAL FIRE burn ban does not apply to the Forest Service because yeah, of I know. what we're doing. So, um, so even if they put it into play and we have an opportunity for the right unit with the appropriate amount of risk, um, we could we could potentially okay. burn into that first or second week of June. Okay, um, that's what I wanted I, to know. Yeah, I don't. Last year I was trying to do it, and we had a thunderstorm come over and and put down just enough moisture that we couldn't do it. So yeah, um, so I will continue to explore those opportunities, but. Um, it's uh, it, the closer we get to uh, the first day of summer, the percentage of chance drops significantly. Okay, I just kind of wanted your feel on it because mine is, it's it's going to be really early, early this year that things are just going to tighten off and and so I just was looking for a little input. Yeah, yeah. Baseball season's fully underway and it's not raining out games yet, so um, yeah, it's going to be yeah. a good year. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions for Tim? Thanks, Tim. Really appreciate all your hard work. Yeah, I need to come to more meetings, and then I won't get bombarded uh, as long. <laughs> We're punishing you. Yeah, that's what five months worth of questions. Um, 
Okay, so I think that's it. We don't have anybody from the Watershed Research and Training Center because Dylan is no longer there. So um, he's still there. He's still, he's there. still there. End of April. End of April. He is. Yay. He okay. is taking the next two weeks off, so he will be mostly unreachable. Okay. Um, I have updates from. Okay. All right. Maya has updates from Amelia. Yes. Um. Yeah, Amelia sent me a long list of updates to give for the Trinity County Fire Safe Council. I will do my best to relay them and answer questions, though I may just have to pass those on to her um, since I may not have the answers. Um, the local area advisors and neighborhood advisors programs are going to be advertised in the paper next week. Um, those applications are ready and available. I have copies here that people in this room can look at. Um, I'm not sure exactly where they are online, but I'm sure they're on the Fire Safe Council website. Um, and in that advertisement, there's going to be a QR code uh, for people to scan with their phone and easily access, um, as well as like a link that they can go to. Um, the community meeting in Sawyer went well, Amelia said there was a good turnout from the Willow Creek Fire Safe Council. Um, in April, there will be community meetings in Junction City and Down River. Um, she's collecting notes to update the CWPP, as mentioned um, earlier. And then she's scheduling meetings for Hawkins Bar and Burnt Ranch as well. Um, Amelia is working on CAL FIRE and California Fire Safe Council grant applications. Um, we are preparing for Wildfire Preparedness Day as well. That's on Saturday, May 7th. Um, anyone who has not RSVP'd um, and wants to participate in some way, whether having a booth or a presentation, should RSVP to Amelia or I by April 1st. Um, we will also be advertising for that next week. Uh, we have the flyer finished, and when we get that full list of presentations, we'll post that as well so people can see what's happening all day. Um, there will be a presentation of the FireWise Community Certificates to the VFDs during that event, so any representative of the VFD can receive the certificate. Uh, next week, I will be attending a uh, California Fire Safe Council workshop in Paradise, and then Amelia is going to a similar workshop for county coordinators in Mount Shasta uh, next month. And then about halfway through the list. <laughs> <laughs> She's busy. <laughs> um, Amelia has been coordinating with Humboldt County and Willow Creek Fire Safe Councils on upcoming storm cleanup funds. Um, they're developing new programs in the area for youth, um, connecting California Conservation Corps um, and Youth Conservation Corps uh, crews to do fuel reduction work there. Um, the hazard mitigation plan, we've been working with Ed Presley to move that forward. Um, we are going to start advertising the survey uh, next month. Uh, collecting survey information also from community meetings uh, to input that into the hazard mitigation plan. Um, let's see. The evacuation maps um, are ready for review. <laughs> um, they, the maps will be at the chief's meeting next month. Um, also will be sent out to all the chiefs via email, I believe. Um, and then Amelia says, don't, do not forget to submit the data for completed projects from 2020 and 2021 to Denise. Um, the report will be uh, releasing the report for the completion of CWPP projects in May and presenting preliminary data in April. Okay, any questions about all the things that Amelia's doing? She's doing a great job. And so is Maya. <laughs> um, okay, anything else for the good of the group? I, I, I was wondering, did she say how many people signed up for the Big Red Truck program? 
How many departments? How many departments? Uh, I am not aware. Okay. Okay. So I just said, All right. it seems like in every meeting, I'm the one that has to remind the four service to let everybody know that they've got community meetings coming up. <laughs> so uh, Carol mentioned briefly that uh, Tara is going to have a community meeting in Trinity Center on April 5th. There's going to be one in Weaverville on April 6th. And Dina uh, and Fashion, I'll pay attention to this one. April 7th is supposed to be in Burnt Ranch. I think they start at 5.30, go to 7 or something like that. And just, you know, for, for the Trinity Center meeting, you know, we've been telling people this is your chance to really come talk to Tara, you know, your district ranger and tell her, you know, what your concerns are, what projects you'd like to see, you know, questions you have, you know, just this is your chance to one on one kind of have a chat. So um, hopefully she'll get lots of feedback and compliments for coming out and talk to people. OK. So I think that's it. Oh, three o'clock. Um, if nothing else, we are adjourned. Cool. Thank you, right, everybody. See you, later. see you later, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Working with you, Aaron. <laughs> Thanks, all. Have a good one. What's the name? Oh, it's the name of the road. They were talking about. Oh. Spell it with our eyes. <laughs>